Good morning, everybody, and welcome, Richard, to another edition of Coffee Talk. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great, Randy. How about yourself? Good, good. Had our little snowstorm, and uh, that's it for Indiana for the rest of the winter <laughs> season. We're, I, I saw my I, I saw my shadow. I didn't see my shadow. Doesn't matter. Yeah. It's going to be great weather moving forward. Positive yeah, power, positive I, thinking. <laughs> I don't want to see my shadow because it looks way too fat these days. So I, I just, I really don't want to look at my shadow. <laughs> <laughs> great, great motivation to get to the gym, right? <laughs> well, we, uh, we're, we're really excited about what's coming up this summer. Speaking of summer, uh, June uh, 15th through the 17th, we have the Marching Arts Intensive, which is part of the Con Summer Institute. Anything you want to say about the Marching Arts Intensive, Richard? I just think it's um, going to be such a great opportunity for some hands-on experience for folks. Uh, Randy, you, you know, you and I go to clinics all the time, and, and we also present clinics a lot. And, you know, sometimes um, people will walk away saying, well, you know, it's it's great concept and all that stuff, but what do I really do when I get back to my group? And I think um, we're going to focus on exactly that, what you should do when you get back to your group. And we're gonna hear from the experts, the best in our field. Um, so from the Blue Devil staff to the rest of our um, uh, faculty, just fantastic people when it comes to marching arts. And they will tell you what they think are the most, uh, what are the best practices right now uh, for getting your group to sound great. Yeah, that's great. And it's it's gonna be absolutely organic experience because we're gonna have a live marching band there. So. This will be the first opportunity that the clinicians have had a chance to work with these students. And so it's going to feel like the first day of band camp or the first yeah. day of summer rehearsals um, that you'll be able to witness. So great experience. Uh, the, the link is posted here in the chat. So make sure that you uh, register. And, and you can, of course, go to any of our previous episodes by going to Marching Arts at Thinkific, which is the platform, the warehouse, where we store all these free episodes as well as our webinars, our weekly webinars. So please join us uh, this summer. Well, you know, as we as we travel uh, the country and we're working with groups, one of the things that often comes to mind um, with a lot of groups is how to approach articulation. And I think, you know, I'll just start this off by, by, and throw it to you. You know, just understanding that articulation doesn't live in a vacuum. Uh, depending on the instrument, depending on the voice, uh, you know, of the instrument, whether it's clarinet or flute or trumpet, um, there are some different approaches that we have to take. You can't, it's not one size fit, fits all. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you can still come up with uh, very simple articulation exercises. And those are the ones that I uh, really recommend. And I'll even talk through one here in just a second. But um, I think that is important to understand that every instrument is a little bit different. Um, the syllables are certainly different. Um, etc. So you've got to make sure that you're covering all your bases in terms of all the instruments in your group. Yeah, absolutely. So talk about the exercise that you use with a full ensemble. Okay, so I'm going to keep this really, really simple. And I know some of you know me pretty well, so you, you probably know where I'm going with this. But um, the exercise that I still use with my honor bands and my all-state bands is I still think uh, one of the best exercises. It's simply a whole note um, usually I will warm the band up until they're up to F concert and then we'll do it on F concert, but you can do it on different notes. You can do it on low B flat, upper B flat if you want, even though that push, pushes range a little bit, but I would keep it on a pretty comfortable pitch. If we do F concert, uh, a whole note for four counts, trying to get their best sound, beginning of the note, sustain, release, four counts of rest, then two connected half notes, four counts of rest four connected quarters, four counts of rest, four lifted quarters. Now this one's really important because this is the articulation that we use more than ever in band. And that's 75% note length, where they're thinking do, 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 or da, da, depending, but 75% note length. Then eight connected eight notes, eight lifted eight notes, and then back to the whole note. The goal being, of course, that we sound the same from a quality standpoint, no matter what the length of the note is, or no matter what the articulation is. And, and Randy, I'd love to hear your opinion on this, because I do think that um, folks sometimes think that there is a different use of the tongue um, depending on the length of the note. And I'm not sure I really agree with that. Uh, it just seems that, uh, you know, you have to be, I think for students, pretty consistent. 
uh, with how you use the tongue. For example, I think whenever I do that exercise with folks and we get to the eighth notes, lifted eighth notes, they start using really, really heavy tongues, which is just not necessary to do. And I always use the, I know you've probably done this too, Randy, where I use the one taste bud analogy, uh, just keeping it nice and light and uh, making sure that you're thinking about your sound. Because even though it's an articulation exercise, I always say that every exercise is a sound blend and balance exercise, even if we're working on articulation. Hope all that made sense. I know I went through that pretty quickly. No, that's great. It's, you know, in terms of the, your question about how to approach, you know, some people think that you should, you know, approach different note links differently from an articulative standpoint in terms of what the tongue does. It's really more about what does the tongue do to the airstream? Yes. And, and, and so just getting students to sense what, you know, the fluidity of the airstream, understanding that the tongue is really um, just kind of a, a gateway to the start and the end of the note. It's, it's not the thing that's actually creating that physically to happen. The air right. is still involved. And, and so uh, the tongue could be a door or it can be a swinging pendulum. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather be a swinging pendulum than a door because when it's a door, the air stops and then we have issues. So um, now, Randy, we can certainly- but, Just one more thing real quick, Randy. I, I, I know we want to get this finished up, but I'd, I'd be interested to hear your opinion on this. I always feel like students will use their tongue and leave it there instead of getting it back out of the way. And that's that's something that I think really changes their sound. Am I thinking correctly there? Absolutely, you know, brass players tend to allow the tongue to stay there if they're over articulation or over articulating. You know, the one time that that changes is with the jazz articulation, mm -hmm. when you want a T release, right, right. which in jazz is a stylistic approach, but in symphonic playing, you want the resonance on the back end of the note, right? So you have to keep the tongue forward and down for that to, for the air to pass. Um, anytime the air the the tongue starts elevating too much for brass players, that causes a problem. But the the absolute opposite of that is a reed player. A right. reed player wants that tongue to yep. rebound as quickly as possible so the reed can vibrate. So those are the important differences. And I think a lot of times, and that's why I mentioned one size fits all. If you're a beginning band teacher or a middle school teacher and you're teaching all the students to to tongue like brass players you're going to have woodwind players that are constantly going to have the tongue on the reed and there's always going to be vibration issues and sound issues that are created by the ver by the virtue of doing that so um you know just taking a rather deep dive into how I approach that is very very important and honestly when i was a young teacher i tended to avoid talking about articulation yeah. sometimes because i didn't know what to tell the woodwinds me too and, me and too. you know and it was maybe the five minutes of information I got in my methods class yeah. <laughs> that I would help them with. But I really had to work at, at learning how to do those things. And, and that's where a young teacher can really benefit from going to clinics and, and you know, asking woodwind players how, to, how they approach that. Um, and, and that's why it's not one size fits all. So very, very important. That's, that's great information for everybody. So the word of the day is articulate and articulate correctly. <laughs> And don't forget about that three-letter word air. Thanks so much, Richard. Yep. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next week on Coffee Talk. Thanks, Randy. Take care, everyone. Bye.